Uh, his first talk is going to be about uh, superconductivity via repulsive uh, interaction. Today is the day of lectures by organizers. Yes. Tomorrow as well, by the way. Uh, yeah, so uh, there will be two lectures, and uh, they're both under this umbrella of superconductivity of strongly correlated electrons. Uh, the first one will be a bit about concepts with uh, funny pictures, at least some of them. And uh, I'll try to go back and pretend that you didn't hear any lectures before on superconductivity and say something uh, in general words. And then uh, in the second part of the lecture, I hope that I will have time, I will basically be talking about how superconductivity A emerges out of repulsion. So this will be the key subject of today. And second, how it, competes with, uh, how it competes with competing orders, by which I mean magnetism, orbital order, charge density wave, uh, you name it. And uh, so this is what will be today. Uh, sorry, today means before lunch. Uh, and after lunch on the blackboard, uh, I will give you some ideas about what happens with superconductivity near a quantum critical point where the issue of attraction versus repulsion will be just put by hand under the rug. So interaction will be by construction attractive. So, uh, but there will be another issue. Superconductivity will be competing with non-Fermi liquid. And so there will always be competition, either with competing orders, which is more Fermi liquid-like picture, or with non-Fermi liquid, which requires dynamics. So this story will be story without dynamics. This story will be story with dynamics. Let me start with something which is very crude, not exact, but I like it because it's really a simple concept. What we need for superconductivity. Basically, if you look at uh, standard Rudy theory for metals, standard prediction from Rudy theory is that can the resistivity should remain finite at t equal to zero, simply because um, current is proportional to electric field with the coefficient, which is conductivity, inverse resistivity. And then if you calculate resistivity, as long as you have finite lifetime of uh, excitations, means fermions are moving, say, along just one direction, scatter, change their direction, moving into other direction. And if you include uh, finite lifetime of excitations, meaning finite time before between collisions, you find out that uh, resistivity is finite number. And if you replace uh, Hund by Maslow, you will find the same and uh, in his lectures, I guess, at the beginning. Uh, but uh, first of all, this is dissipative current. I mean that um, to sustain current, you need always to borrow energy from the source of electric field. Uh, which means that you put electric field to zero and current stops. But uh, it has been known, actually, before theory of superconductivity came in, that if somehow the system of macroscopic number of particles is described by a single macroscopic wave function, meaning that there's infinite number of particles in the same quantum mechanical state, then, which is called condensate, then this condensate wave function generally has amplitude and a phase, and you use quantum mechanical formula for the current, and you find that there is a current proportional to the gradient of the phase, and this is not accompanied by any energy dissipation, and generally would exist even if, you are, if uh, electric field is zero, and if you have finite current and zero field, which means that this rho is zero, which means that resistivity is zero. Uh, so, uh, the outline of this simple reasoning, again, a little bit oversimplified, of course, is that once we have macroscopic condensate, we have superconductivity. And at weak coupling, this is pretty much the story. Uh, then the next argument is even more simple, that you open textbooks and you ask how to get condensate, this Bose-Einstein condensation. So if you have bosons, there is no problem. Bosons like to accommodate at the single level, generally with k equal to 0. And so you always get mach at zero temperature up to quantum fluctuations. Bosons tend to sit at the same level with minimum energy because you can put all of them into this level. There is no contradiction with quantum mechanics. But for electrons, as we know, with fermions, there is a Pauli expulsion principle. And uh, two fermions cannot simply exist in one quantum mechanical state. 
which immediately brings second argument that, however, if you take two fermions and form bound state of two fermions, even not necessary with zero momentum. Zero momentum is just for simplicity here. Uh, bound pairs of fermions of two objects with spin one half has spin either zero or one, so it behaves as a boson. So you prepare and ob prepare objects which then condense. Again, there is a separation between forming a condensate and, uh, sorry, forming bound pairs and condensation, and this is a story about the difference between BCS and BC. Let's not go into that business here. Let's just say that at the end of the day, if we form bound pairs, they will eventually condense. Which brings, of course, simple issues that we need to pair fermions into bound state. If we manage to find a way to pair them into bound state, then you follow this line of reasoning and you get eventually a state with zero resistance. Uh, now, uh, this is the same phrase. Uh, you go back in time, you ask this wonderful Nobel Prize for, I guess, really, probably the best theory in physics in 20th century, and you find out that this BCS, bardeen cooper schrieffer theory, consists of two parts. One is uh, mostly attributed to Cooper, in fact is a statement that you don't need strong attraction. Any attraction will do the job, meaning that infinitesimally small, attra small attraction is enough to create, super, to create bound pairs because we call it pairing susceptibilities logarithmically singular at small temperature, we call it Cooper logarithm, but in reality what it means is that in condensed matter physics as opposed to high energy physics, we deal with the system with finite number of fermions, they have Fermi surface, and therefore states with zero energy are states close to this Fermi surface. And if you take integration in any dimension, in fact, I put D3 here just to be in three dimensions, then essentially up to a constant, it translates into integration transverse to the Fermi surface, which is always one dimensional. If you don't have KF, then D3K is D3K, K squared DK. So you basically get out of k, k square or any, in any dimension, k to power of d minus one. Very good, so this one part, the second part is of course what actually accounts for attraction. And second part of this theory was that if you consider exchange by Funas, which is quantum of lattice vibrations, yes, if you forget for a second about Coulomb interaction, you get attraction because there are a number of ways to explain this. Neither of this is exact, but the story goes like this. You have one fermion that creates, vibra creates distortion of the lattice. Then after some time, another fermion comes into the same range, reads the distortion of the lattice, and through distortion of the lattice, two fermions talk to each other, and there is attractive interaction. Just finish phrasing that. Yeah, go ahead. I cannot hear you, sorry. Let's try to do it again. And? Uh, electron. Electron is attracting the positive ions. But I'm talking about effective, maybe I don't understand you, but I'm talking about effective interaction between electrons mediated by vibration of electrons. So. The point is that that electron, how can a single electron can attract the positive ions which are very massive? Ah, but only by a little bit. You don't yeah. need to move them by the whole lattice uh, spacing, just by... Yeah, uh, it's small. that small. <laughs> okay, one way or another, uh, but uh, this is the story that I don't want to go in details. Exchange of phonons give rise to effective attraction between fermions, which for our purposes is this. There is a foreign object with respect to electrons, and this foreign object mediates interaction between electrons. There is, of course, an issue about electron-electron repulsion with respect to this one, and uh, I guess Kole Prokofiev in his lecture probably will touch about what's the interplay between Coulomb repulsion and electron phonon interaction. Quite interesting that this problem, which was supposed to solve 50 years ago, uh, is not solved. So people are coming back in 
this year, in fact, and discussing again how to properly uh, deal with interplay between Coulomb repulsion and electron phone interaction. But putting this aside for a second, story is that if you consider this at this foreign object, you have a possibility to get attraction between fermions. Now, the story in pictures goes like this. TC was, superconductivity was discovered in uh, 1913. Then temperature was gradually going up and then went up vertically almost overnight. It was basically half a year when temperature went from 30s to uh, over 100 Kelvin. Uh, probably this is the record Nobel Prize given next year after the discovery, which is unthinkable in other, other fields. And at this stage, we're looking just as a picture. TC went up substantially. There was new discovery, new breakthrough in 2008, superconductivity in iron-based compounds. I'm essentially repeating the lecture that Ian Galeas gave. And uh, temperatures are not as high as the cuprates, although there were reports about at least one material which has TC of close to 100 Kelvin, but it's definitely record in uh, terms of nature, science communications, and all those glossy journal papers that accompany this. Uh, so the question is, uh, is TC relevant? So far, I just play the game. We get strong enhancement of TC. In a slide which I steal from Gersh Bloomberg, uh, there is a MGB2, phonon superconductor, as again, uh, repeating the statement which doesn't belong to me, apparently available by mail for 48 years, but nobody bothered to measure. Although there were measurements that didn't go low enough in temperature. So this material has TC of about 40 Kelvin. 40 Kelvin is quite comparable for iron, at least iron-based superconductors and first family of the cuprates. So in this respect, we can say this is high temperature superconductor. This is a phonon superconductor. Uh, I hate asking people questions because questions means that I know the answer, you don't. Uh, but the record holder, at least before there was a publication three weeks ago about new record holder, which community is now digesting. But before that, uh, the record holder material uh, has TC of about 200 Kelvin under pressure, and this is phonon-based superconductor. So in this respect, if you ask which materials have highest TC, these are ordinary phonon-based superconductors with the caveat that ordinary still means that you need to include all dynamics of electron-phonon interaction and solve more accurately than just BCS theory. So here is what I'm going to talk about. The question is, what is actually relevant? And then it turns out, although there is no monolithic, uh, no, not everyone in the community share what I'm going to tell you about, but if you ask, if you take a survey, I guess it will be 99% in the community uh, that believes that if you consider cuprates, iron, nictites, rutinates, uh, the material that was discussed here, uh, heavy fermion materials, organic superconductors, the list can continue, then electron phonon interaction probably is not responsible. Probably means that, yes, there are people who are still saying that maybe it's electron -elect modified electron-electron interaction, and I don't want to present that the problem is solved completely. But I'll just give you one example. That uh, from the group that worked on electron phonon interaction for years, even if you neglect Coulomb interaction and just calculate what TC would be in iron nictites, you get one Kelvin. You can twist things, change parameters a little bit, and get it from 1 to 5, but you will never get 60 Kelvin. So it's a huge difference. And then on top of this, there is also negative effect from Coulomb interaction. So <clears throat> if not phonons, there is also symmetry reasons why phonons in some cases may not uh, be the case. But if not phonons, if there is no foreign body that mediates interaction between fermions, then what? And the answer is there are not too many choices in the system. In fact, there is only one choice, electron-electron interaction. So this is where I actually start, how to get superconductivity out of cool, in fact, screen Coulomb interaction, which is repulsive interaction. And there were talks about, as I said, that electron-phonon interaction 
is relevant, definitely relevant for some physics in these materials, but probably not a glue for superconductivity. So how to get superconductivity out of repulsion is the subject of what I'm going to talk today. And I go back in time. Uh, I will take this tour back to 60s for about 10 minutes and then uh, talk about what people do nowadays. So the story really started in the early 60s of last century due to actually, as history shows, two independent works. One was done by Landau and Pitayevsky. This is the work I know more about. And uh, there was also, at about the same time, the works by Phil Anderson and uh, Morel um, pretty much saying the same. And both groups said a couple of things. First, generally it's a bunch of statements. Statement number one, that fermions can form bound state with angular momentum. The forms that we discuss, the two fermions just attract each other. We always assume that there's some constant attraction between fermions. If constant attraction, if there's a constant attraction, then the only possibility to form bound state is uh, with angular momentum zero meaning no angular dependence whatsoever. But in principle, interaction can depend on momentum transfer. You can look at the pairing quantum mechanical problem, in fact, of bound state of two fermions with arbitrary angular momentum, which is not exactly superconductivity, but nevertheless, for this reasoning, it's OK. Um, and uh, what is most important uh, is that pairing problem decouples between harmonics with different momentum, which means you may have a repulsion in all channels with all momentum, except for one. And strong repulsion in other channels will not affect pairing in a state with a given momentum. So it's really factorization, which means that there is much less severe restriction on interaction. It doesn't have to be attractive at all. Sorry, it doesn't have to be just simply attraction. It can have just one attractive component and it will be enough. And this is the most important part out of all this reasoning. And there is a third piece, that if you formally consider large value of angular momentum and ask from where this interaction comes from, you find out that large distances are important. Again, it's a simple reasoning based on quantum mechanics. You can calculate which relative distances contribute to interaction with different angular momentum. And you find the larger the angular momentum, the larger the distance. Which immediately brings me the issue that if you go to large distances, then what is screen Coulomb interaction? We normally say, well, it's Yukawa potential, so interaction gets screened and dies off exponentially, but there is more. At large distances, there is also oscillations, and this is uh, interaction essentially become occasionally over-screened, and this oscillation are due to robustness of the Fermi surface. Uh, and, uh, in fact, these oscillations can of, are called Friedel oscillations. And, in fact, uh, there are people here in the audience who did very extensive studies of charge density wave and Friedel oscillations have been used in studies of charge density wave. All we need for us is this minor things here. That interaction which is generally repulsive, positive, has some range of distances where it occasionally gets simply over-screened and changes sign. And so the question then is this. Is it enough? Can we just use the fact that in some ranges of distances between particles there is occasional over-screening and get attraction in some pairing channel? Which brings me to the story which, in my opinion, revolutionized the field but was not really appreciated well at that time. It's a story by Kohn Lattinger, 1965 who basically calculate this very accurately. Uh, what they did may look like just second order perturbation theory, but they did much more. They did much more accurate analysis than second order perturbation. What they said is let's suppose that all regular screening not taken into account free the oscillations is already taken into account. So we have some regular potential UFR. We have no idea what this UFR is, but we assume that it's repulsive. Repulsive means that all components of this interaction with any angular momentum are repulsive. Then on top of this, there is a bunch of diagrams which account for screening leading to Friedel oscillations. And so you get effective interaction 
which includes this effect of free daily oscillations. You expand this interaction, the screen, fully screened interaction, in angular harmonics, and ask the question what happens, and the answer is that interaction is definitely attractive, at least for odd values of angular momentum. With even values, it can be attractive or repulsive, depending what you put, what are the interplay between u of zero and u of two kf in momentum space, but for odd, for, uh, odd values of m, it's a minus full square. So it's definitely attraction. The numbers that they get in this paper were enormously small. They get TC for D wave pairing being 10 to minus 17, so nobody took them seriously. Although, interestingly enough, if they put the numbers in their papers for P wave pairing, they get one millikelvin, which is pretty much the same as superfluid temperature for helium-3. Uh, and this was before superfluidity in helium-3 has been discovered. But uh, from theory perspective, this was really a big step forward. Because statement was, if you have attractive interaction, yes, you get most likely S-wave superconductivity. For interaction which is repulsive because of overscreening due to free daily oscillation, which is a necessary effect, you still get channels which are attractive. And you do get superconductivity because pairing problem factorizes between different channels. You don't care how strong your repulsive is with an S-wave channel if you want to study channel with angular momentum 23. Uh, this was, in my opinion, first real example of what's called superconductivity from repulsive interaction. You can take a simplified version of con -Lattinger. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 wait a second, wait a second, you can do two things. If you take fully screen interaction, fully screen interaction, you don't need to go to second order, you just take this fully screen interaction and expand the an angular harmonics. You get what I said. What I said is that what they did, they basically said, let's assume that all regular terms are included up to infinite order and give some attractive, some repulsive interaction. And then accurately considered effect, singular effect due to, um, uh, free daily oscillation. You may ask, what's the small parameter to do this? Value of m. So their theory is rigorous for large value of m, and then you find out that higher order corrections due to free daily oscillations are small in powers of 1 over m to fourth power. So they took leading terms in the expansion in m. But nowadays we break the rules, and so more simple version. Suppose that instead of arbitrary interaction, actually answering to precisely the question that was asked, instead of arbitrary interaction and all this rigorous physics, I will just say take Hubbard model. And just Hubbard model, as you know, it has, it's attractive, it's repulsive interaction, sorry, but if it's a constant, it only contributes to S-wave channels, simply because there's no angular dependence between particles on the Fermi surface, an interaction between particles on the Fermi surface. So <coughs> just do, take this U and go to second order perturbation theory in U. Well, if you go to second order perturbation theory in U, you find out interesting results that, to, again, to first order in U, there was repulsion in S-wave channel and nothing in all other channels. You go to second order in U, you calculate standard second order diagrams, you find the interesting results that all channels, no matter even odd, doesn't really matter, they all become attractive and the largest is P wave. So in some sense, statement here is that if you take Hubbard model and ask what superconductivity you get, the answer will be P wave. If you get attractive interaction, ask what superconductivity will be, it will be S wave. So it makes story even easier. Uh, in fact, if you go back to con and ask what they get in P wave versus D wave, they get the same. They get attraction, strongest attraction in P wave channel. So it's the same story in some sense. Okay, uh, I want to talk about latest systems that people start to study, study nowadays. Uh, and then this concept doesn't work fully. There is no theorem in latest systems that there is always will be superconductivity. You may cook up a model that in principle will be repulsive in all channels. The reason is you cannot, 
expand in angular momentum. There is also discrete number of orthogonal one-dimensional and two-dimensional representations. And so we cannot say m equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You don't have this choice. As a result of having no choice of having parameters that goes from 0 to infinity, there is less option. And so I warn you that there is no statement that any system necessarily will become superconductor if it has original screen Coulomb interaction. At the same time, at least I don't know any counterexample in real systems that the system never becomes superconductor. So it looks that any real system always find a way to find at least one attractive channel. And so let's try to apply kuhn lattinger reasoning to these systems and see whether this will give us simple understanding of what's called non-phononic mechanism of superconductivity. Uh, this is what I'm going to do. Let me start with coup rates. It will be really level zero coup rates. Nothing particular compared to very detailed talks that you heard last week. So let's just briefly look at the phase diagram. Antiferromagnetism is here. Superconductivity under either hole doping or electron doping. Uh, through the gap which attracts so much attention over the last 15 years. Uh, let's go here or here. Let's go to high doping either hole doped or electron doped systems. And just from experiment, these are systems with large Fermi surface that satisfy Lattinger count, which means that volume of the Fermi surface is proportional to the number of particles. This is what you expect if nothing particularly striking happens with the Fermi liquid. So let's assume that these systems can be treated within, in quote, weak coupling. Namely, coupling may be of order of one, but nothing drastic happens between small coupling and moderate coupling. You just can look at these Fermi surfaces and simply ask where the action should happen. So I will try to apply the same reasoning as kohn lattinger did, but to lattice system. And you ask simple question, where the action should happen? Well, I didn't tell you about, but I'm sure that you all know that when you look for superconductivity, to get dimensionless coupling constant, you multiply interaction by density of states. So you ask a question, where the density of states is the highest? And of course, you find these corners as a region where the density of states is the largest. So let's look at fermions at these corners and play a very simple game. So we include two interactions. Let's take fermions in region one and in region two. I will consider spin singlet pairing means that the gaps that I have order parameters that I have here at my point k will be exactly the same as point minus k, and the gaps that I have here will be exactly the same as here. So I don't need to include four. I, it's enough to include two points. It will be by symmetry the same as the other two. So we take these two regions, even not points, regions, and I'll just introduce two interactions. One will be within patch on the Fermi surface. Let's call it G1. Another will be between patches. Let's call it G2. In standard notation, one interaction is a small momentum transfer, while another interaction is at large momentum transfer. So this is what I put here. We need to solve for, for the pairing, so we do a standard BCS-like analysis, solving for, we introduce order parameters, read them, superconducting gaps here and here, solve two by two problems. This is pretty standard BCS problem with L as a Cooper logarithm. Notice minuses everywhere here, means repulsion. So if I forget about the second term, for example, and try to solve this equation, I will not be able to solve this equation because I cancel out delta and get one equal to minus something positive times big positive logarithm. So there is no way I can solve for superconductivity if I don't include interaction between patches. But this is two by two problem. So everyone in 10 seconds can write down what is eigenvalues. And there are two eigenvalues for the problem. One is the sum of the coupling, another is the difference between coupling. Convention is such that for the pairing, you need lambda negative, and you clearly see it here. It will be great to change the sign of G1 to be, make it negative, then you don't need this guy. You solve this problem already. So these are two couplings, and we'll play the game with two couplings in this example and in the next two examples as well. So let's do kohn lattinger story. What means kohn lattinger story? I'm not going to expand in angular harmonics. I will take simplified version of kohn lattinger namely, 
I go to a situation with Hubbard interaction. And at first order in Hubbard interaction, and this is important because the same story holds in nictites, even if you take five orbital model and include all this fancy stuff about going from orbitals to bands, what you find is that if you have online, on-site repulsion U, you will find that both interactions are U. You don't care whether it's an interaction at small momentum transfer or at large momentum transfer. In momentum space, Hubbard interaction is a constant. In real space, is delta function. So then both of them are the same. And then you see interesting situation. In one channel, you have strong repulsion, right? But in the other channel, you get zero. You don't know what it is. It's neither repulsion nor attraction, zero. Very similar to the simple version of the Conlatinger in an isotropic case, when I take Hubbard U. Remember there, it was repulsion in S-wave channel and zero in all other channels. Now I don't have all other channels because of lattice. But I still have in one channel strong repulsion, and we are that it will be S-wave case, simple S-wave. But in the other, we get zero. So what we do? What we now call con Lattinger. We do second order diagrams. Don't think that it's schematic. All other diagrams are canceling out, so there's only one left out of second order. So you calculate this coupling to second order, and you get the interesting result. Let's not talk about how to calculate and how to get these results. You find out that this guy, interaction at large momentum transfer, becomes larger than interaction at small momentum transfer. And it happens in all systems that people study, no matter what. Cuprase, pnictides, doped graphene that you will see, Twisted graphene in this regard. Everything in all systems just goes the same way. You do perturbation theory, you start, if you start with Hubbard model, interaction at small at large momentum transfer is the same. You add second order corrections, interaction at large momentum transfer gets larger than the one at small momentum transfer. Which means that one of the couplings here becomes negative. This is what you need for pairing. You see, it's very similar to con original con Lattinger story. You renormalize your interaction, you screen it, if you like, and you get attraction in some other channel. For the original one, which is S-wave, you started with repulsion, you cannot do anything. It's just continuous as repulsion. You can ask, what is the eigenfunction for this solution? Very easy to calculate, eigenfunction changes sign between 1 and 2, which is completely clear from actually this form. Remember that if G2 is nothing, is 0, you don't get a solution. How to get a solution? Make, G, make delta 2 of opposite sign to delta 1 and make this guy larger than this one. Then effectively by changing sign of this guy, you change sign of interaction. So in some sense you get attraction between delta 1 and minus delta 2. And if this guy is larger, you can get a solution. But you need opposite sign. So, sorry, you get minus plus or plus minus doesn't matter. This is just your eigenfunction, right? I told you it's spin singlet. So what you have here is what you have here. What you have here is what you have in this range. Let's put it. And you immediately recognize this is D wave. Why? Because going over one segment of the Fermi surface, you go from minus to plus. So you ought to have zero in between. You have four zeros. And this is D-wave. So you get D-wave right on the spot. You don't need to do anything fancy to get D-wave pairing in this situation. And out of all this uh, infinite number of experimental results for, uh, for cuprate superconductors, the one that earn Waters Buckley Prize is this one. Uh, gap, modulus of the gap, in fact. Extracted from ARPES measurements exactly around this um, arc of the Fermi surface. And you see it goes from maximum to maximum. Remember, there's a modulus of the gap going through zero in between. So it's exactly T wave. Uh, of course, it's only tip of the iceberg of uh, cuprate story. There is a bunch of other things. This even list is incomplete. There is mod physics at half filling. There is a pseudo gap for which every theorist has ideas sometimes two conflicting ideas from the same series. Uh, there's a decay and coherence, which comes of non-fermial physics. 
completely non-trivial spin dynamics, etc., etc., etc. But uh, D wave can be understood simply. I mean that let's separate different le diffi different levels of difficulty. D wave I claim can really follow from completely basic stuff. Uh, of course, you need to calculate TC, you need to find out why TC is large, but this is a technical problem. Once you get a pairing symmetry, the rest is how to properly calculate TC for this particular pairing symmetry. Uh, let's continue for the next five minutes or ten minutes with two other examples. Uh, one I will just use because I will use it later when I will be talking about um, competition between superconductivity and other ordered state. So iron nictites, pretty much the same as cuprates, some uh, uh, diluted version of cuprates, not that well established mod physics, and in view of some, me included, there is a little evidence for mod physics in these materials. Uh, but uh, still, magnetism, you dope either by electrons or by hole. There is another axis here which is called isovalent doping. You get superconductivity either way. Pneumatic phase was subject of discussions here in one lecture by Rafael Fernandez. Uh, I'm talking, I want to talk about superconductivity and I just put an incomplete list of people who were talking on uh, iron-based superconductors, of course. Well, Rafael was not talking about iron-based superconductors, so I didn't forget. Uh, he was talking about general pneumatic order. So, you look at fermiology of the system, and of course it's a zoo. There are many states, there are five uh, D orbitals of iron, there is also uh, P orbitals of arsenic, uh, and uh, it's really zoo on the level of, say, bit, probably between minus 4 EV to 4 EV. But if you zoom into low energies, then you have set of fermi surfaces, the one that the plate with in cuprates, there was very easy, there was just one Fermi surface, one D9. Uh, so one orbital there. Here is more than one orbital. But out of this orbital physics in the band language, you get circular or nearly circular hole pockets in the middle. You get electron pockets at the corners. And this wonderful word, hole pockets and electron pockets, means simple things. Electron pocket means the dispersion is ordinary. That you write when you ask to write any dispersion, it goes up. So chemical potential cuts somewhere and stays below chemical potential or field. Whole dispersion is opposite, invert. So it goes down. So states, you again cut by Fermi level, states away, states at low, lower energies are field. So states inside the pocket are empty. So we have these two states, and we don't care at this moment which one is electron, which one is a whole. What I want to do is simplify this story even further. What I want to do is to say, suppose that we have a place, simplest possible game for pnictides. Instead of all this orbital physics, blah, 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 we just take one, whole, one pocket in the middle and one pocket at the corner. This four just means the same because this is pi pi and these points are added just simply by symmetry. So you really have to look into this part. Very quickly, why don't we play the same game as before? Same game means we take two interactions. One will be inside pocket, another will be between pockets. So what I did, I just replaced the word patch by the word pocket. Same story otherwise. And again, we have two repulsive interactions, so we can play the same game, solve two by two, we get exactly the same story. One, cup, one eigenvalue is the sum of the coupling, another eigenvalue is the difference between couplings, Again, convention is such that we need negative lambda for superconductivity. Yeah, Yuri, go ahead. No, absolutely not. No. And in reality, if you take real system G1, inside whole pocket is not the same as inside electron pocket. Uh, so, no. No, what you need, you, the question was this. If this is G1 and this is G1 star, what we have? Well, you solve a little bit, your expressions are a little bit more complex. You get eventually the same result, yes. Yes, you get eventually the same result. Okay, now, particularly, right, then 
look, I can answer your question in a second. Suppose that we have Hubbard interaction. Then we don't care about anything. Interaction at any momentum transfer is the same, right? What you really are saying is that this size of this pocket is not exactly the same as the size of this pocket. So in general, interaction should be different. But if you take Hubbard, you don't care about this. Yeah. So let's play the simplest game. I really try to oversimplify the problem as much as I can. We play exactly the same game as before. We do consider Hubbard U to first order. Again, one of the couplings is zero. Another is positive. Do second order. Same story. Interpocket inter repulsion exceeds intrapocket repulsion. So then one of the couplings become negative and superconductivity can develop. And you can say I'm telling you a completely boring story because I didn't change anything. Uh, with only one exception, that now there are Fermi surfaces and now this plus minus sign change is not between patches on the same Fermi surface, but between different Fermi surfaces. And so I get on this Fermi surface plus, on this Fermi surface minus. This is the amplitude of the gap, or if you like, phase of the order parameter between this Fermi surface and this Fermi surface changes by pi. And you may ask, is it still D wave? No, it's not D wave. The reasoning is very simple, because this is Fermi surface encircling zero. So you take a circle around this Fermi surface, no changes in the gap value. So in terms of symmetry, you make a circle around zero, and you don't change anything with the gap. Previously, we made a circle around zero, we find four nodes. So that was D wave. Now it's not D, it's S. There is nothing changing. The only thing that changes is the sign from here to here. So this is another S, which is called, which is termed S plus minus, or sign changing S. And so the question is, what experiments tell you? Remember, for Coupe there was one experiment that clearly showed that there was no at 45 degrees. Right? This is really an experiment for which Buckley Price was given. Uh, now you look at nictites. First ever experiment done on this angular dependence, and you see it's actually co almost constant. Much more sophisticated laser arpis on this isovalent phosphorus dot material. Actually, three whole pockets, so it's a story not a one by one. And you get the gap, which is pretty constant. So definitely not D wave. The gap does not change if you make a circle around this pocket, which is S wave. How to prove that it's S plus minus, not an ordinary S? Well, you look at neutron scattering data. And neutron scattering data find very nice, sharp resonance peak below twice the gap value in the superconducting state. And people remember story from the coup rates, how to explain this peak. Basic message is very simple. You don't need to do fancy physics. All you do is a standard BCS physics with coherent factors. You look at spin response of a superconductor, and you find out that if gap between k point and k plus pi at the point in momentum at which measurements have been done, if this is satisfied, then there is a residual attraction between particles in the superconductor in a manner similar to how Higgs mod get pushed below to delta by charge density wave order. Residual attraction between fermions here push resonance below to delta in spin channel. So this is nothing but spin response of a superconductor which has this property of a gap. It doesn't say anything about pairing mechanism in reality. It doesn't say anything except for that if you do a standard BCS theory with proper coherent factors, you get this result. But Nevertheless, if it's like this, theorists are saying that you are supposed to have a resonance peak below two delta. If it's not like this, you get nothing. You can judge by yourself, yes, there is a resonance. And to me, this is a, probably the best indication for S plus minus, not the only one. There are other indications. There are wonderful um, STM data by Hanaguri interpreted completely correctly as strong evidence for S plus minus for sign change of the gap. But Nevertheless, historically, I guess it was the first. So, looks like boring story, but you get S plus minus and iron nictites, you get D wave for the coup rates, right? Let's play one more game. It will give us a more interesting result. Let's suppose that we apply the same reasoning to dot graphene. Uh, 
well, graphene is uh, honeycomb lattice made of carbon atoms. Uh, it's famous for having Dirac points in the dispersion. So we can write down what is nearest neighbor with dispersion if you take nearest neighbor, hoping, in fact, if you add nearest second nearest neighbor, nothing will change. And story goes like this. It all depends on what is the, where is the chemical potential. If chemical potential is zero, you have Dirac point right at the Fermi surface. If chemical potential goes up or down, you start creating Fermi pockets. And if you look at this picture, this K is Dirac point. If you can see colors here, you see a small Fermi surface in each initially appearing. We basically cut here, so we get small six disconnected pockets appearing near all these K points. And then as chemical potential goes up, 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 this disconnected parts gets larger and larger until finally at some point that they merge and the system experiences what's called Van Hoff singularity and transition from six disconnected parts of the Fermi surface into one large Fermi surface. You need pretty large chemical potential for this. You need mu equal to plus minus T1 for this. So it's a huge scale, the scale of electron volt. Uh, looks like science fiction, but uh, by the way, yeah, if you have this particular point, there are points, there are six points in the brilliant zone where different Fermi surfaces merge in one direction, split in the other. This is called one half point. Uh, there was experiment. Okay, uh, small typo. Uh, one of the KYs is KX. One of the K? In the dispersion. Oh, OK. Uh, yes, sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks. What a stupid I am. Thank you. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, experiment. In fact, experiment. Photo emission. You put uh, kalium and potassium under the suspended graphene, etc. Let's not go to details about which I don't know much, but let's look at the figures. So you start with the small pocket, which you clearly see around Dirac point. It grows, it grows, it grows. It becomes more triangular side, keeps growing. And then you see one triangle, another triangle tends to merge. And now you see merging of, or almost merging of these two triangles exactly as it happens here. So it's reality. You can dope. The question is, of course, what, how good are your data, but you see it visible. You see it with naked eye, what's going on. So let's look what, let's play our game in this situation. So now we have, again, play the same game. Where is the largest density of states? Well, here, no question. In one of these points, because basically these are one half points, and uh, density of states just diverges. So what's shown here is in red is the Fermi surface, right at the point where triangles match, when we are going to go from six disconnected pieces of the Fermi surface into one large Fermi surface. In black is the brilliant zone boundary. You may ask, is there any meaning of this straight line here? The answer is no. This is because we only included first and actually, uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, there should be one of them, it should be KX, of course. Um, so uh, it's only because we included nearest neighbor. If we include third neighbor, you start seeing dispersion here. But the points survive. So let's focus on physics around these points and play exactly the same game that we played. Uh, what's the difference? There is one difference that you can see right here. How many, how many points, different points that we need to play? Three, right? How many interactions? Well, again, three equivalent points. So we have interaction inside patch and interaction between patches, and they're completely equivalent. So we have G1 and G2, two interactions, three points in which we solve four order parameter. So set of three equations with two interactions. We get three coupling constants. Again, the one that is here is against any pairing. The one that is in between patches, well, may help us if we properly change sign of the gap. But it very much resembles triangular case, right? We have triangles. So if we get plus minus between the two, it's just like icing spins on triangle lattice. The third one will be completely uh, unhappy because it doesn't know whether to get plus or minus. So let's see what the resolution will be. So two solutions, but notice this AB, two are degenerate here. 
Not surprising, I should get three couplings. I have three by three. So two are degenerate, and there are special reasons why degenerate is not going to this. So standard. First order in U, this is definitely positive, which means that this is conventional S wave, plus, plus, plus. Will never realize because of repulsion. This is again zero. And go to second order and use same story always. Interaction at large momentum transfer gets larger than interaction at small momentum transfer, nothing else. So you get attraction in two channels immediately. Both are attractive. Solution is doubly degenerate. Let's look what are the solution. What are eigenfunctions now for these two degenerate eigenvalues? Let's look. This is one eigenfunction for this triangle. Zero, delta, minus delta. We consider spin singlet superconductivity. Sorry, this is the second one, I'm sorry. Delta minus delta over two minus delta over two. Sum of the three is zero, but these are two different eigenfunctions. By symmetry, of course, because it's spin singlet, what you have here, you should get here. So we get this two. Okay, let's play a game for 10 seconds. What symmetry of the pairing state? How many zeros when you go along this hexagonal? How many sign changes? This is how we check symmetry, right? We go along the Fermi surface and ask how many times our order parameter should change sign. I show this order parameter in the corners, assume that between corners is gradial. So the answer is D wave, four, right? Look at this. Uh, we change sign here. We change sign here, we change sign here, and we change sign here four times. Here is zero, one, between this two, second, third, fourth. So both are D waves. So we have two different D wave states, right? They are degenerate. Call them, these are wrong words. They are originally called by us, in fact, dxy and dx squared minus y squared. These are bad notations. This is just by analogy with square lattice. Don't call them this way. Call them D1 and D2, two different states. Very good. But if I have the degeneracy between two different states, I obviously ask a question, what the system would prefer to develop below TC? Would it prefer to develop this state, this state, or combination of the two? Well, for this, you just calculate free energy. You need to calculate this coefficient. There is a standard technique. In fact, it can be done really very simply. You calculate these two coefficients. And what is interesting is that if you take this order parameters and add phases, this term depends on the relative phase of these two guys. Then you do calculations. You find out both coefficients are positive. You minimize, do 30-second calculations. You found that magnitudes are the same on both, which means both develop. But the relative phase between the two is either plus pi half or minus pi half. It's just because of proper sign of this K2 term, which means that you have two different states, and the system develops one of them. One state will be D plus ID, where the phase rotates by 4 pi along the Fermi surface clockwise. Another is D minus ID, when the first rotates by 4 pi minus clockwise. These are the states that, these are spin singlet version of P plus IP superconductor. You get it in five seconds. You really get it by just doing simple con Lattinger analysis. You don't need anything fancy. But the result is sort of fancy. You get a state which breaks time reversal symmetry. So you get the chiral uh, superconductor chiral because it's basically one, is, one component is symmetric with respect to K minus K. Another is anti-symmetric with respect to um, changing Kx to minus Kx or Ky to minus Ky. So superconductivity which breaks both time reversal and parity can be obtained by exactly the same mechanism as D wave and the cup rates S plus minus and iron peak times. Uh, we have some hope that in uh, twisted graphene where superconductivity was found it's relatively close to one half point, maybe this is a pairing state. Uh, but um, I have hope, and there is, I guess, already three papers on the web saying exactly this, that it's this state and uh, that twisted graphene has this superconductivity. We'll see. Maybe not. Uh, now, in the remaining 20 minutes, 
I will do something a little bit more sophisticated. Yes, please. You are asking about numbers, or you are asking about what happens if I go away from Hubbard U and do different interaction? Second, it's this slide. What happens if I, this story is too good to be true? Absolutely. Because where I cheated you, I cheated you, just let me finish the phrase. I cheated myself and you in one aspect. I said Hubbard model. And by saying Hubbard model, I assumed one thing. I assumed that interaction, let's put it this way, that interaction at small momentum transfer and interaction at large momentum transfer to first order and you are the same. So I started with zero. My point of departure was zero, either in original con Lattinger in all channels with non-zero angular momentum, or in our case in D wave, S plus minus, D plus ID. In all the three channels, I started with zero. Then I could go to second order and say, OK, to second order, on top of zero, I get something negative. Great. But if I ask any of you in realistic situation with screen Coulomb interaction, uh, which one is larger? Then, of course, the interaction at small momentum transfer is larger. Think about 1 over q squared weakly perturbed by, um, by uh, screening. Same answering to your question. If you consider u of q, but not u, which means, if you like, interaction on site, second neighbor, third neighbor, you will not get attraction, you will not get zero at the bare level. You get repulsion at the bare level. And then all the story apparently falls apart because what I said, we do perturbation theory on top of what? On top of already repulsive interaction. Well, we change it a little bit, but we need to now overcome something finite, finite repulsion. So the question that I will address is the remaining, whatever, 15 minutes today and all lecture in um, the afternoon is basically how we think about how to overcome the repulsion. In the meantime, of course, this is uh, what we have right now. And let's see there are two main theoretical approaches if we assume that nobody who is very strongly for mod physics is in the room. Uh, for people who very much like pot physics, I'm just not considering it here. It's another possibility. But two main approaches is this. One approach is to say, okay, let's assume that we abandon perturbation theory. We say, we don't deal with perturbation theory. We use some sort of phenomenology, experimentally motivated phenomenology, to essentially justify that interaction at large momentum transfer by physical reasons is already larger than interaction at small momentum transfer. How to obtain this? We say, well, I'll give you one example in the afternoon how to do it. But neither of this example is theoretically justified. So in reality, it's some sort of abandoned perturbation theory. Take something and pretend that it comes from experiment and use phenomenology to get it. Then the issue will be essentially this will be a story about superconductivity near quantum critical point. As I said, the issue will be, yes, there is, a repul there is attraction. I put it by hand. But then you will see that this attraction fights against non-Fermi liquid, which tends to destroy superconductivity. What we'll do in the 15 minutes today, we'll say, OK, how about we keep interaction weeks, but see whether there is a possibility to go to enhance con Lattinger meaning to go beyond second order and still be on a rigorous basis. So in some sense, we are searching for ways to some infinite series of corrections instead of going to second order perturbation theory. And uh, this is what goes under the word parquet normalization group analysis. I'll be mostly refer to what was done originally by uh, Dilashinsky, Yakovenka, and uh, Sasha Finkelstein in this analysis. But what I want to say is that, park, that RG exists with respect to the systems that I'm considering in two versions. I'll be talking about analytical RG. There is also a large number of people, in fact, much larger group, doing numerical functional RG. So far, there is no single case when this and this give different results. But we'll see. Uh, 
what I mean by RG will come later as a word, but uh, what I really mean is this. So far, remember what we said. We said we start in realistic system. We start with a situation when interaction at small momentum transfer is larger than the one at large momentum transfer. So we start with repulsion in both channels. Let's look iron nictite simply because formulas look most easier in iron nictite case. So if we do this, then the only thing we need to look at is this. We can say, are these the interactions that we need? And the answer is no, these are terms in the Hamiltonian. Terms in the Hamiltonian is what we call bare interaction. And they're generally defined before we integrate out high energy fermions. So these are, in this respect, defined as the upper, upper edge of the theory, which is generally bandwidth. However, to solve for superconductivity, what we need is interactions at the level comparable to Fermi energy, or smaller than Fermi energy. At least in these systems, if you don't take the zoo of states into consideration, just look at the scales. Bandwidth, few electron volts, Fermi energies, this is the upper boundary. In some system, Fermi energy is 10 times smaller than this. So there is a huge range in between. What happens? When you want to know what are interactions here in this region, you already need to integrate out contributions to interaction from all these fermions. And this is what goes under the name interaction flow when we go from higher energies to lower energies. Flow means they acquire renormalizations when we progressively integrate out high energy fermions and want to come out with effective theory which only knows about what happens with the interaction between low energies. And this flow of interactions, it happens in all channels, including particle-particle channel and also particle-hole channel. So all channels contribute here. And you may say, aha, uh -huh, we are at weak coupling, so why don't we care about other channels? There is only one channel where we know there is logarithm. But in fact, if we look at iron nictites and go very quickly to this, remember I told you there is one band dispersion down, one band dispersion up, this is called electron band, this is called whole band. Let me now calculate simply particle whole, not particle particle, susceptibility at momentum transfer between these two channels. And when you calculate this, you find you get logarithm. I guess this is what the first done by Keldish and Kapayev many years ago in the context of excitonic insulator. Uh, but uh, all we need is basically logarithm here. What it means? It means that if we ask, are there logarithmical renormalizations? Uh, they are from two channels. They are Cooper logarithm from particle-particle channel. And there is another logarithm from particle whole channel. And this means that if we want to include logarithmical terms, we need to include both channels, particle particle and particle whole. And you may say, well, what's the point of doing this with logarithms? Well, in fact, presence of logarithm and perturbation theory is a blessing. It's a blessing because we can go beyond low, lowest order and perturbation theory. And the way how it's done, basically, is like BCS theory of superconductivity is done. In BCS superconductivity, you say coupling is weak, but renormalizations are logarithmical. And so if you want to solve order by order renormalization of the pairing vertex, this is what's called Cooper logarithm story, then you sum up terms. Coupling, next term will be coupling square times logarithm. Next term will be coupling cube times logarithm square. You neglect here terms simply g square. You neglect here terms g square times uh, sorry, you neglect here terms, uh, say, g cubed times logarithm, for example. So you always neglect terms which are just simply small in coupling constant. But there is a way to sum up all these terms, namely, you know all these coefficients exactly. And this gives you a famous result that tells you that if coupling is, this is sign of multiplication, there's no star here. Uh, if coupling is negative, you get instability at BCS transition temperature. The reason I mention this is that, A, to say that if you have logarithms, you know the trick how to sum up infinite series of graphs. And B, that the same result, exactly the same equation, can be written as differential equation. It's called RG equation, which is, in this respect, synonym to the word differential equation. When you consider this coupling 
as function of running energy, Re read it running temperature, and you write the same set as solution of differential equation, solve this differential equation, you get exactly the same results. And then energy, critical energy at which G blows up is the same as the critical temperature. So viewed like this, you find out that interaction flows from smaller value to larger value as temperature or energy goes down and blows up at some scale. So this is one-to-one -one equivalence. Uh, some prefer this way, some prefer this way. It's really. Uh, now we need to do this when we have two channels, particle hole and particle particle when there are logarithms. To do this, all we need to do is to write down not only pairing interactions, these are G1 and G2 that we had before, intra-pocket and inter-pocket repulsive interaction. If we stay only with this one, we don't get anything because in fact what I did was equivalent to summing up logarithms only in a particle-particle channel. Then you cannot convert repulsion into attraction. It will stay as repulsive interaction. But we also need to include interaction in the particle hole channel because we know that this channel is also logarithmical. There are two different interactions, both in, if you ask what they do, they bring the system close to density wave orders. They are not contributing to particle particle channel per se. Now, what I want to do, I want to write down a set of coupled differential equation for all these couplings. It looks difficult, but in fact, it's not that difficult to write these equations. You just accurately look at all logarithmical renormalizations in the problem, solve them, and they get this fantastic result. This is still under control. My coupling is small. And only not small term is coupling times logarithm. So what you see is this. This is really solution of this set of four equations. This was a bad guy, the one that was against superconductivity. That was a good guy, the one that gave us S plus minus in iron nictides, D wave, D plus ID, whatever. So this guy was originally smaller than the one. This is a statement that interaction at small momentum transfer is larger than interaction at large momentum transfer. But you see what happens under RG. At some point, they cross. And then the system self-generates attraction. It's a really interesting situation. You start with a system with repulsive interaction. You integ start integrating high energy fermions. And at some point, repulsion converts into attraction, which means that upper H for attraction is given within the system. Uh, and as long as this upper H is still on a range when G times logarithm is of order of 1, but G itself is small, you are at weak coupling. You can justify all this stuff. And this is really emergence of con Latinger effect and the controllable calculations because you have more than one logarithmical channel. This is exactly how Morris Rice and his collaborators in various papers treated coup rates close to one Hof singularity. This is how several groups, uh, both numerical and analytically, treated um, system uh, on a hexagonal lattice near the uh, read graphene near Van Hoff point. It was always done the same way. You start with repulsive interaction. You do solve these equations. Number can be larger. And you get this wonderful effect when repulsion eventually converts into attraction uh, at the scale which is still controllable within perturbation theory. Of course, you can say, does it mean anything for iron plectides? Now let me scare you a little bit. Uh, there are zoo of states in iron nictides. I did RG with just one hole, one electron pocket. In reality, if you look at the zoo, there are five, even if you neglect arsenic, neglect oxygen, uh, there is a zoo of five d orbitals. So even if you look at low energy states, you actually have two, two or in sometimes three hole pockets. This is one iron zone, two electron pockets. Different color is different orbital content of these pockets. So you ask about low energy theory, how many different couplings you have. Previously, we have four, right? Two in pairing channel, two in particle hole channel. The total number is 44. So you need to write down 44 coupled equations. If you forget about this guy, uh, you get 30 equations. 30 actually you can handle. Uh, claim is that you can also handle 44. Uh, but interestingly enough, at least numerically, 
What you get doesn't depend on how many couplings you have. It's always the same story. And then I have very few minutes left, so let me briefly tell you what the result is. The result is interesting because it has one more aspect in the story. So previously, the story that I told you before was a story like this. You start with repulsive interaction. If repulsion originally was zero, great. Do, do second order perturbation, you get attraction. You don't need to worry much. If it was repulsive first, then you need to solve this differential equation to see how all couplings flow, you get attraction, right? What I didn't tell you is whether attraction will eventually win over other channels. Because hidden in what I said was the reason why we get attraction. And it turns out that attraction was due to push from the channel which wants the system to develop spin density wave. So this brings another question superconductivity or spin density wave or something else. Let me quickly show you what the results are. So the question is, of course, what is the leading instability? We know that so far there will be attraction in the superconducting channel. Question is, is it the largest attraction or some, something else will happen with the system? And for this, we have various options. We have magnetism as a possibility, superconductivity as a possibility. There was a lot of talks about pneumatic order. So let's put all of them into start, meaning that we ask in which interaction we have, in which channel we have the largest interaction. And we ask who will come eventually to the finish. And just very quickly to repeat, initially what we have. For spin density wave, we don't need attraction. Repulsive interaction give rise to stoner criteria for spin density wave. So repulsion is good for spin density wave. In this respect, converting words, interaction in spin density wave channel is actually attractive, meaning system wants to develop spin density wave. Interaction in superconducting and I didn't tell this pneumatic channels are repulsive. In the process of RG, as we know, Interaction and superconducting, this we told, and I didn't tell you also pneumatic channels. For this, you need to solve this 30 or 44 RG equations. Uh, in fact, it also becomes attractive, and both attractions are due to push from spin density wave channel. This is the typical result at the end of the day. What you really need to do, so far we wrote RG for the couplings. Then you need to go to second stage RG and write differential equation for the vertices. From that, you write differential equation for susceptibilities. To make long story short, this is the result. The rule of the game is you calculate susceptibilities in different channels. The channel in which susceptibility diverges with the largest exponent is a winner. Why? Nobody really knows. It's just the idea that if susceptibility diverges strongest, then probably the system will develop this order. To be honest with you, nobody checks this accurately. But let's play this game. This is a magnetic channel, this is a superconducting channel, and this is also a channel with orbital order. I don't want to go into details except that the point is this. Originally, magnetism is a winner. Tendency towards superconductivity is simply because we have repulsive interaction. Superconducting and orbital channels are both repulsive. Now, let the system move, meaning let's integrate out contribution from high energy fermions. This blue guy pushes red and also green up, meaning this interaction that leads to spin density wave pushes interaction between patches, which is good for superconductivity and also good for pneumatic order. And you see what happens at the end. Red and then green actually win. So depending on where you stop your RG, it can be either superconductivity or actually pneumatic order. Both possibilities are there. But what is interesting, and this is, for this you need really to go to two-stage RG, that it happens quite often in politics, uh, that one interaction, attractive interaction, creates two other attractions. And these two other attractions combine to create negative feedback effect on the source. So basically, what happens is that result of the source, it tried to eliminate the source. And uh, this is exactly what happens here. At the end of the day, these two guys, superconducting and pneumatic channel, when become attractive, they give negative feedback on the channels that make them attractive in the first place. And as a result, magnetic susceptibility doesn't diverge. 
So why is it important? Well, because there is this wonderful material, iron selenium. You probably have more than necessary about this material. There's a large number of talk about it. Remember what happens in this material is here. There is a pneumatic order. There is superconducting order. Where is magnetism? No magnetism. So I guess I'm done. So let me very quickly flash conclusions. Conclusions so far is that A, to get superconductivity if you start with Hubbard model, it's just and you get it. You get it just doing second order perturbation theory. And you seem to get right pairing channel for at least three classes of materials. But if you want to do something more sophisticated, you go and look into what happens. Look, first of all, why you get attraction. Because it turns out that in spin dense, in interaction in spin density channel, in fact, pushes interactions at large, pushes up interaction at large momentum transfer, and at the end of the day, give attraction to superconductivity. But if you want to do a more sophisticated way, you find out that uh, there is a feedback from superconducting an orbital channel that tends to destroy the source, destroy magnetism. Uh, which means simple thing, that superconductivity or orbital order happened before magnetism. The system, before developing magnetism, the system always develops either superconductivity or orbital order. Okay, let's stop here, and second lecture will be on the blackboard. Okay.